you can hear me okay. It's great to be here in New York. It's great to have you on behalf of Al Monitor and Semaphore. Thank you for joining us for what promises to be an engaging and uh, insightful conversation on uh, the Middle East. I'm Joyce Karam, Senior News Editor here at Al Monitor, and it's my ga great pleasure uh, to be having the opening conversation with Dr. Anwar Gargash. Many of you know him. He's uh, an advisor to UAE President uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, and he's a former Minister of uh, State uh, for Foreign and International uh, Affairs. So without further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Gargash uh, to the uh, stage. Hello. I think we might need both mics. Uh, Dr. Gargash, great to see you. Great to have you here. I think last time we've had one-on-one -on -one conversation in New York, it was in 2019. Pre-COVID, pre-Abraham Accords, pre-Beyonce performing in Dubai. Um, a lot has happened. It's a very high moment for UAE diplomacy. Uh, you're hosting COP28. You're, uh, you've joined the BRICS. You're on the Security Council. Walk us a little bit. How would you define UAE diplomacy today? Well, well I want to start by saying that uh, you can't really put COVID and the Abrahamic Accords uh, in Actually, the same importance as the Beyonce concert, okay? <laughs> so let's just That's fair. Have, have perspective That's there, fair. Yeah, okay? Well, I want to I wanna start actually by thanking and monitor, thanking Semaphore for uh, this gathering. I think we need uh, more voices of uh, reason uh, to cover the region. I think the region needs uh, this, and I think also uh, with this new uh, Semaphore venture, uh, we will have actually, you know, a global voice added to uh, the new cycle and what we are seeing today. I also have to say that I'm honored actually to be speaking here and to know that, uh, you know, one of the pillars of wisdom in the region, King Abdullah of Jordan, also will be speaking today. So I have to acknowledge that. I think the important thing I want to say is, uh, the, you know, we're here because we believe in multilateralism. And I think uh, the UAE, I mean, the way that this has worked, we've been tooling up for our uh, position on the uh, UN Security Council. And everything we've been doing uh, has not taken into account that we will have a crisis uh, of the magnitude of Ukraine. You know, we were more focused on issues of development, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, trying to understand more and more African issues, gender issues, and so on and so forth. And suddenly, your whole priorities change because of a monumental event uh, such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And of course, I think that we, uh, uh, you know, our team has really done a stellar job. Uh, you know, from the beginning, I think we saw ourselves as a bridge. So in many, at, in, in, in many, many instances, when the big five were not talking to each other, it was countries like us that ensured that their conversation uh, goes on. I mean, again, if a country is our size marginalize themselves, they will be marginal. If mm -hmm. countries our size are able to be active and are able to make a change, then they will be able to be active and make a change and will receive a lot of heat uh, in the midst of that. Other than that, of course, uh, this multilateralism, we, you know, our biggest event this year will be COP28. And again, with COP28, this is, uh, this is something unprecedented because you're talking beyond politics, you know, daily Middle East politics, and you are trying to really contribute to something that is important to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think from that perspective, our logistical success of COP28, I am sure of. But the outcome, I think, uh, will depend really on everybody's contribution, on what happens with other countries. No one country can actually come out with a successful outcome on uh, energy transition and climate change. But I think for the UAE, we have seen this and we have been uh, one of the 
Middle East countries that uh, have taken an interest in climate and energy transition for more than 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. and I think at the time we were doing that, uh, there was a lot of pushback of how can a hydrocarbon economy uh, bother really about these issues which uh, don't make uh, quote unquote business sense. But I think in reality, uh, this is a sort of forward thinking that uh, in my opinion are important to countries. Uh, on on uh, multilateralism, mm -hmm. we have been part of our fourth G20 meeting. We are going to be uh, part of the BRICS countries. So again, I think this is all part of the three dimensions that are important in our foreign policy. Number one, the region needs stability. Mm -hmm. But you can't really promote stability to people who are struggling in their daily lives in the Arab world. You have to also talk about prosperity. You can't just come and say stability because stability is only for the rich. But if you come and say, I need stability, I need prosperity. And I think with these also, you need tolerance. Mm. The Arab world uh, in general, the Middle East in general, uh, has been uh, incredibly an, an intolerant place. So I think in many, many, uh, in many, many cases, we have sort of broken what people thought were barriers. The invitation to the Pope to visit the UAE was unprecedented. Now, you know, the skies didn't fall down and, uh, you know, life goes on and that has been established. And I think in many ways also, you might have your uh, qualms about the Abrahamic Accords, etc. But I think it's also a major, major, uh, you know, a major, major change in the region. Mm. Or, and, and this will bring about, in my opinion, a greater change in the region. So will... as we move forward, and I'll stop here, as we move forward, I think this is what is actually uh, moving us. We're moving more in a, in a geo-economic space rather than a geopolitical space in the coming period. Mm. You know, that encapsulates really where we are moving uh, and what we are trying to do and to do it with partners. I would like to stop at, you mentioned multilateralism. <coughs> Is that the same as multi-alignment? Uh, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, I love to listen to your events sometimes. And at an event last year in the UAE, you've said, and I'm quoting, the change in the global system is the rule. And U.S. dominance as a global hegemon is not sustainable anymore. Uh, what did you mean by that? And I'll, I'll ask well, you further. Don't, don't believe this. everything I say. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but, uh, We'd like to, yeah. but... No, I think seriously, I think this is a long-term view. A long-term view is I think the U.S. will come out of the Ukraine crisis uh, much stronger. I think it will be re-energized. I think uh, America on the world stage is coming back very strongly. And I think the handling of the Ukraine crisis so far has been uh, part of that success. But it depends really how things end. Now, having said that, I think longer term, you know, longer term beyond that, uh, you know, the, the unipolar world is going to change. You know, so basically your uh, core alliances, such as the one we have with the United States, is going to be a cornerstone. But that does not mean that you are unable to link up technologically with India, with the China or India or other countries. I think as the United States has a pivot to the East, we also have uh, interest in the East. We have an interest with India, China, Indonesia, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, I mean, these are the major countries that we uh, work with also. But again, uh, it is not a substitute to our relationship with the United States, which is cardinal, and it's definitely not a substitute uh, with our relation, old relationships also with Europe or within our own Arab world and Middle East uh, area. Now, the idea basically is how can you balance all that? It's difficult. But that's where we're moving. I think we have to sort of think 
20, 25 years ahead, and these things take time. But I am definitely a believer that the United States, from what I'm seeing in its economy and its technology, and definitely also in uh, what is happening in, in the war in U Ukraine, the, the United States is going to be re-energized uh, coming out of this uh, crisis. Uh, I mean, that is very interesting, but I want you to, to tell us, go deeper into what is the scope of uh, UAE-China relations uh, today. You've mentioned technological. Um, in Washington, D.C., we hear, you know, a lot of reports, uh, officials sometimes complaining that there is a defense aspect yeah. to the UAE-China relations that is not okay with, yeah. with this administration. Well, if well you again, can. I mean, we have to think that in terms of trade yeah. uh, with the UAE, for example, the big numbers are China and India. Mm -hmm. that every year, every single year. India this year is going to hit somewhere like $90 billion of trade with the UAE. China also is a, a big competitor. So you can't ignore China. You know, but I think you have to also come and say that uh, the United States remains your core security relationship. Now, if you take, for example, COVID, the UAE uh, had a hugely successful uh, approach to COVID, which was extremely practical of uh, basically trying to maintain uh, business as usual and at the same time, uh, you know, make sure that all the measures, safety measures, health measures are in place. We couldn't have done it without China. We couldn't have done it without China because we uh, were able to, uh, to reach uh, an agreement quickly on uh, various vaccines and on uh, detection, etc. If we did not do that deal, we would have been part of another 100 country uh, waiting in the dole uh, for the manufacturers of these vaccines to, uh, you know, sort of give us bits and pieces of that. So these are important relationships. And I think the idea uh, and, and the fears that uh, this is going to, uh, you know, replace one relationship with another are extremely false. I mean, we see the effectiveness, for example, of uh, U.S. equipment in Ukraine. And I, you know, don't think that this doesn't, uh, you know, make an impression, not only on us, on various other countries. We see all these things. And I think the important thing is the idea that any uh, sort of approach to countries in the Far East is at the expense of uh, your traditional uh, source, uh, areas of investment and areas of security. Uh, that doesn't make sense, to be honest. Uh, our major, you know, I mean, for every dollar we have in the East, maybe we have 10 in the United States and the West. I mean, that continues to be the case because, again, you've got governance here, you have clarity, mm -hmm. and you're not going to throw your money uh, at places where you don't have that sort of governance. I mean, it just makes business sense yeah, and track record. Uh, uh, for sure, that does make sense. Um, you mentioned, so you, you still view the U.S. as your core security yes. uh, partner. Uh, you've also mentioned uh, equipment being used in, in Ukraine. Since you mentioned security equipment, I have to ask you, what is any, any update on the F-35 uh, sale that happened? Uh, no, I think we are still interested in the F-35. Okay. We are interested in the F-35, but again, we have our technical and what I would call sovereign requirements, and I think once this is addressed, I mean, these deals take a long time. So we don't give up. We're still interested. But, you know, again, we can't be in a region where our ability to defend ourselves and to sort of have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a prominent uh, uh, force or, uh, you know, be, be held back mm -hmm. because of technological inferiority or because of uh, sovereign requirements. I mean, we're very clear on that. So are you optimistic that eventually the UAE will get We're always F optimistic. It took a long time for us to do the F-16 deals. But again, you know, we have to take uh, into account our own requirements. And I think, you know, at some stage, things will have to move. Because again, America's 
involvement in the region from our perspective is a positive thing. Mm. America's engagement in the region from our perspective is uh, a positive thing. So for us, of course, uh, you know, for us, it is extremely, extremely important that the U.S. remains engaged, that there are no vacuums. And when there are vacuums, this is where you give opportunity for other players to move into these vacuums. Mm -hmm. If there's no vacuum, other players will have to find their own niche in working with you on agriculture or something else, for example. Uh, to stay on defense just a little bit, um, Bahrain signed last week a defense agreement uh, with the U.S., our uh, Pentagon correspondent, looking to find him here somewhere, Jared uh, Zuba, reported that um, uh, Washington, the U.S., would like to replicate this defense agreement with different uh, GCC countries. The scope of that agreement, it's uh, how, how far it goes in terms of deterrence, would that, is that something that would be enough for uh, the UAE. Well, again, I mean, the, the, the main principle, Joyce, is mm -hmm. that the U.S. Uh, commitment to the region uh, was, quite, uh, wa was quite informal mm -hmm. since the Do Carter Doctrine and so on and so forth. Moving forward uh, and, and taking into account what has happened over the last few years, it is important to move from being informal to something that's formal. Mm. Then, of course, it has to be ironclad. I mean, from our perspective, uh, the U.S. commitment to the region uh, in 1976 with the Carter Doctrine has done quite well. But the world has changed, the region has changed, the technology has changed. And as a result, of course, uh, we believe in principle with the idea of moving from an informal sort of understanding to a formal uh, commitment. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what a formal commitment looks Why? like. We, we could, I mean, uh, with, Because I'm not we? a lawyer, <laughs> uh, I'm not a lawyer. We're good but, at making news, but, uh, but... But again, I think I think something that I can <laughs> see that there is a commitment of uh, the U.S. coming to our... Uh, defense and committed to our security for the next 30 years, for example. So you're looking for something, you're looking for an agreement on the defense level I, or guarantees or... And I think it's also in America's interest to be engaged in the region and for its mm. friends to understand that America is engaged, I think. You but know, you're looking for a defense uh, agreement. Because I think it's in the interest of both parties. Okay, thank you. Uh, on, I want to uh, talk a little bit about Iran. Monday, we heard big news, prisoner exchange. There is talk about revitalizing the uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear deal. How is the UAE adjusting uh, to the absence of, of a deal of, you know, with the nuclear program uh, now being on a threshold of uh, you know, well, weaponization? I think, yeah. I think to start with, uh, Joyce, is uh, Iran is a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And whether... Uh, you know, we go through hard times, uh, less hard times, because it's either hard or less hard times. Uh, Iran, Iran is still a neighbor. I think uh, what uh, we've gone through a very tough 10 years in the period that's called the Arab Spring. And I don't think that the region can go through the same period of, you know, another decade of confrontation and, and etc. Mm -hmm. I don't think Iran has changed, but I think we are trying something else, which is again moving from geopolitics to geoeconomics. So basically, we're not only working on uh, the competitiveness and prosperity of the UAE, but we are also working on uh, various things that we want prosperity in the region. So again, you've seen, for example, the IMS. Uh, pipeline, or, or not pipeline, yes, the corridor. Yeah. Uh, again, we're working on several corridors. We're not only thinking of one corridor. Mm. We're thinking of a corridor Your that members of the belt, will, uh, will involve Turkey. We want a corridor that involves Iraq. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, with sanctions gone at some stage, we're thinking of a corridor that will go north uh, via Iran. Mm -hmm. I think it's important as 
we try and speak about stability, as I said. We have to also offer, uh, you know, offer uh, basically something that tells other countries that they have to be partners in uh, prosperity in the region. I mean, I mean, again, you have to also understand that the UAE can be a first mover, but the UAE can't do things on itself because we are still a medium-sized country with certain capabilities, but with what I would say very high uh, hopes. And, 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 and from that perspective, I think we need partners. Mm. We can't do it alone. I mean, we couldn't work on uh, the India to Europe corridor without Saudi Arabia, without India, without the U.S., uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, help on that. We couldn't do it without Jordan, without Israel. But that's not the only corridor we are. We think the region needs. I think the region needs various logistical and economic corridors. And I think this will bring about uh, important change. Now, that is our message to Iran. So in many ways, in uh, our diplomacy with Turkey, with Iran, countries that we've had quite a difficult relationship, especially with uh, in, during the Arab uh, Spring period, etc., our message has been very, very economic. Our message really is not trying to basically solve issues that we haven't been able to solve in the last 30 years, because you, you know we're not going to be able to solve them in the next 30 years. So our message has been more about, uh, you know, getting them involved uh, in uh, an initiative, in initiatives of uh, greater economic interest for them. Mm. And I think de-escalation has also been part of it. Okay. Now, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the nuclear uh, agreement, I think, you know, again, it's no use for us, you know, beating a dead horse again. We've mm. said all we can about what went wrong uh, early on by not including the countries in the region in the dialogue, by uh, our various concerns about Iran's uh, um, uh, regional politics, etc. I mean, we've said it until we've lost our voice. So for us, I think to go back and say, no, we've got to do this again and again, we're practical. We want to move on, and I think Time will tell whether our current approach, I mean, it's working with Turkey, but also will our current approach also work with Iran by trying to uh, make Iran a partner in, uh, in the region. Uh, this will be a tougher sell, to be honest, but that's what we are trying to do. What are must-haves for the UAE in any future uh, deal or understanding with Iran on the nuclear front? Again, I mean, I mean, the lines, uh, you know, again, I don't want to talk about the nuclear uh, program per se, but, you know, we are worried about proliferation in the region. If there is actually uh, an Iranian breakthrough, we are, you know, we are worried about it. But I think our interest more is in the regional uh, politics of Iran. And I think trying to get Iran involved has not been easy, but I think also for Iran to understand that it is better for it and for the region to act like a state uh, and to benefit actually from this uh, period of uh, hopeful anticipation of greater things in the region. Mm. I want to take you to uh, the Abraham Accords three years on. Uh, was this, has normalization with Israel paid off? Yeah. Can I say in this room that it's been successful? <laughs> you can <laughs> say anything it, <laughs> in this room. <laughs> <laughs> because it has been successful. I mean, it has been successful. It's going through a difficult time right now, to be honest, uh, because of the sort of far-right policies of the Israeli government. But again, I want, from our perspective, to sort of uh, dissect the relationship on two levels. On the strategic level, the Abrahamic Accords are something that we will continue regardless of what is the government of the day in Israel. I think the government of the day will change in Israel, but our uh, you know, sort of strategic approach to peace will not change. Now, the second part, of course, is we are having issues. And we have made it very clear to the Israeli government that 
We are not part of any rhetoric against Iran. We've made it very clear to the Israeli government that uh, we are uh, very cognizant mm -hmm. of our friends in Jordan and Egypt, and we don't want Israel to take, or the current government to take a position it's taking vis-a-vis -vis Jordan and Israel. And we are very also cognizant of not making any changes to the holy uh, places that and changing cool. the status quo. These are, for us, important red lines that we have put across. Now, was the Israel, uh, the Abrahamic Accords, envisioned to solve the Palestinian issue? It wasn't. Mm. So for people who are really saying that it didn't really do anything to the Palestinian issue, you know, my argument or our argument is we had had all our leverage with the Palestinians for uh, since the inception of the UAE in 1971. And, you know, we've given them basically check blanc mm. and they haven't done anything with it. And we've taken it back and said, let's do our own thing. Now, I think in many ways, the two Arab countries that have been most helpful uh, with regards to Israeli-Palestinian relations have been Jordan and Egypt. And they've been that way because they have the connection. They have the link. They can actually speak with the Israelis. So the Abrahamic Accords, as I said, is uh, something that uh, we feel on the economic side has been a big success. I think we feel also that uh, on, uh, you know, even on the value side, in terms of tolerance, etc., cetera, is, is, is been quite sure. a big success. One of the interesting stories is Sheikh Abdullah went to Israel and spent uh, a long time there, a few days, and he saw everybody. And then when he came back, I asked him, what was your most important meeting? Mm -hmm. And he said, my most important meeting was with 30, 35 Arab Israelis, mm -hmm. professionals. That was my most important meeting because they said we were not being acknowledged. We would never have any link to Arab officials, Arab ambassadors, Arab this and that. Now, with you reaching out to us, being able to sit there, we feel that we are more important even within the Israeli political milieu. So that's I think these are important things. I think that's something we've seen more with the Abraham Accords than say with uh, Camp David, the people-to-people -people, uh, relations or with the Jordan Peace Agreement, but we are uh, short on time and I do want to get to Saudi Arabia. Uh, how big is the rift that we're reading about? We haven't seen uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, visit in, in over a year. We haven't seen uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed bin Zayed visit either. Talk us through that. How big is the Saudi UAE rift today? And did yesterday's meeting on the well, trilateral every time, on Yemen every, help? Uh, every time I see our officials uh, meet Saudi officials, I, I wonder, you know, how much of this is made up. I mean, again, there is certain economic competition, which is natural, in my opinion. The UAE writes the rules in the region in mm -hmm. terms of uh, its entrepreneurship in terms of how things are done and so on and so forth. So we will expect that other countries in the region also will actually walk the same uh, path. And I think this will bring some competition. I think that's fair. But I have been, you know, uh, in, my, in the foreign ministry over seven years during the, the Yemen war. And during war, you will always have areas of disagreement between allies and partners, where your kids and their kids are actually on the same front line. I've seen difficult times, and we've always managed to talk together. We've always managed to organize together. So I would say that this is extremely, extremely exaggerated from our point of view. Okay. But certain competition is always part of, the, of, 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 of Gulf politics. You know, we've had it before on oil. We've had it on uh, where we will have the uh, Gulf, uh, you know, central bank mm -hmm. placed a few years uh, ago, I remember, 2009, etc. This is part of Gulf politics. And it's I think... It's not 2017 uh, Qatar moment. Uh, well, no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. I think that, uh, you know, our trade with Saudi Arabia, our links, our cooperation on the Yemen file, our cooperation on the oil file, 
etc. I mean, I read all these reports, mm -hmm. and I say that they are extremely, extremely exaggerated. Okay. Uh, I would be remiss if I don't ask you about Lebanon, uh, my own Lebanon. country, and we have uh, Prime Minister Mikati here in the, in the crowd. Uh, Alan, Alan. What is, uh, is, is the UAE helping at all in breaking uh, well, the stalemate? Well, we have five countries now involved in uh, helping the Lebanese. So I don't think a sixth country is going to help. But I think we are, uh, we are following. I think that the effort that is uh, being, uh, you know, uh, exerted now by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Lebanon, um, sorry, the United States, mm -hmm. Egypt, and France, of course, mm -hmm. France. I think uh, it's, it's quite crowded there, helping the Lebanese. But I think what is really required is more of a Lebanese consensus. I think the, if, if the Lebanese consensus, and I see it very clearly, I think you start really with institutionally through an election of the president and through agreement on a prime minister and making sure that the rules that have been governing Lebanon since 1943 are working and in place. I think that is the main thing. I think the, the, the formula uh, is uh, in the hands of the Lebanese to uh, make things right. And I think uh, based on that, uh, there's a lot of regional support, but that has to be triggered. And I think once that is triggered, I think regional support will uh, be there for Lebanon. Well, I had Sudan, Libya, but you know what that means. Shukran. You'd have to come back. Um, thank you all. Shukran. This has been great Shukran. conversation. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you for being here. Shukran.